potential. Yes, there is a history, a long history of over unity systems. What has happened to them? The, uh, for example, Nikola Tesla had one. Uh, basically, his big magnifying transformer that he had in, on Long Island was such an over unity system. Uh, the way that one apparently worked is he got the entire Earth itself in resonance. The crust of the Earth, as you go down in there, is made of highly nonlinear materials, particularly when you get down to the perovskite or whatever you call that stuff. And it will act in, in the bulk, even. It will interact in a sort of a nonlinear optics fashion. It will do phase conjugation. And so eventually what it, what it does is everything going on is feeding energy into the earth starts to feed energy into that wave that he created. So he gets a lot more energy in his resonant wave fed from outside, from the environment in the interior of the earth. And that's the way he built up a, a humongous wave of energy. His idea was you could then put in a, a tap on it anywhere else on the world and extract it free. And of course, J.P. Morgan's take on that was that's foolish, you can't put a meter on it. So that uh, actually doomed much of Tesla's career at that point when Morgan found out that he, Tesla, was going to produce the energy freely. Small cost here at a central location, everybody else could tap it for free. It wouldn't have powered the whole world today. It would have powered much of the world in those days. Tesla also, we're pretty sure, put uh, a system in a car and ran a car on it. And the reason we're uh, pretty sure is his nephew who rode in the car with him is still alive and can describe the incident and how the engine had no gas, no input of power and would still run once Tesla got it started. And we know it's perfectly possible Tesla apparently knew how to use this giant neg entropy process that's universal everywhere. Energy is free for the taking from the vacuum anywhere you want it. We just have to learn to use that. Some of the breakthroughs in the past have been deliberately suppressed. I will name a few. T. Henry Moray was inspired, of course, by Tesla's work. And he demonstrated so many times to so many scientific and engineering groups and people who were skilled in the art. There is absolutely no question that T. Henry Moray had uh, a system that produced 50, about 50 kilowatts out of a 55-pound box. This is well established as you go back and look at all kind of certified uh, tests and everything else that he did. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of skullduggery that happened there. I don't think T. Henry Morey ever got a decent chance to ever do anything with that. The, uh, the Russians even tried to kidnap him at one time. It reads like a James Bond movie, but it's real. It really happened, and it really happened here in the United States. This was before the war. This was in the 1930s. In the same general period of time, one of the greatest electromagnetic fellows we ever had, scientists, was Gabriel Krohn. And Gabriel Krohn invented a true negative resistor uh, working on a Navy contract for Stanford University. He was never permitted to reveal the exact way that he constructed his negative resistor. But I used direct quotes where he, in fact, said we have a negative resistor and we can disconnect a generator from this network analyzer when we got negative resistors in there because they will power the circuit. So that one was, in fact, suppressed. I don't know whatever happened to it, but it, it vanished. And he never did reveal the secret of what he called his open path, connecting any two points in a circuit. But it is in the literature and it's well documented because he was uh, one of, perhaps the leading electrical scientists in the United States at that time. Well, there's another one that went down the tube. Uh, various and sundry people have made casual ones from time to time over the years. I'd estimate probably 50 different inventors have made, casually invented something. Even if they didn't understand it, they did get it to go over unity. We're never able to get anything done with it. Uh, most of the time, they uh, incurred a lot of enmity from the scientific community. Um, sometimes were really hounded, and sometimes were just very naive. Sometimes very naive. Probably the best documented scientifically uh, over unity system, self-running, self-powering systems, were developed by the Russians before World War II. It's in the French scientific literature, and it's also in the Russian scientific literature. The papers are there. I quote them in, in many of the things that I published. And you can go check the papers, the theory is there. Uh, many papers are published on this in the Russian scientific literature. 
they built what we call parametric oscillators. They have an oscillator going and they change in the middle, they switch the actual inductance or capacitance or both of the thing so that it becomes a self-oscillation device. And they reached, uh, you know, goodly power for that, those days of 50 and 100 kilowatt devices. There are many ways of looking at uh, the suppression that's occurred in this area and certainly I do not wish to talk about it myself, but I've been a victim of quite a bit of suppression. So has any other legitimate researcher in this area. All I can do is give you my ideas and uh, from, drawn from my own experiences and what I think it is and where I think it's coming from. Today, we don't have so much big kingdoms. Today, we have big economic uh, programs, big economic countries, or basically, we have cartels. We have a whole set of cartels in an area, interlocking corporations, and behind this, we have a few people who are quite wealthy and who own most things. Now, the normal nature of the beast for very powerful empires, let's call that an empire, it's a corporate empire, a set of corporations empire, is basically a cartel. Historically, as far back as you want to go, we have had cartels. Any time we have a very powerful cartel or set of people that control a lot of things, that resists any means of changing its inflow of control and its inflow of funds and money and its power. You know, everybody's trying to be the big monkey. It's really as simple as that. And so the more powerful the agency, the more powerful the group, the more powerful the cartel, the more they will resort not only to legal means, but to extra legal means to suppress their competition. Uh, you know, this is an openly known today. For example, the greatest uh, espionage in the world is industrial espionage between one corporation and another right here in America. They're the ones that hire all the spies and the spooky equipment and everything like that, by far more than the intel agents do. So that's one thing we have. We have the giant industrial or really cartel, economic cartels in, in, in energy. And it's not one cartel. So there are many, many groups in energy. And each of those has become very powerful in its own area. And each one does not wish to see uh, simple little electrical taps pulling out enormous energy from the vacuum. They would much rather see uh, you burning a lot more oil and so forth. So. Yes, there's a, in my view, there is a very active uh, suppression effort by those kinds of folks. Part of that goes into very unique areas. They don't do it so, more, so much. It's not totally mafia type stuff. It's not like, you know, you just flat get shot. There's some of that. But one of the main re ways of suppressing it is they take a deep psychological profile of an individual that they wish to suppress. What, what it means is they really wish to get him entangled in all kinds of difficulties he can't get out of. Now, a good trait from a human being standpoint may be uh, a very valuable trait to somebody who wishes to manipulate you. For example, suppose you're easy to approach. That's a vulnerability. That's a serious vulnerability. So one's deep psychological profile is examined in great depth by real experts. And any way that you can be gotten to where you're naive, you don't have, who knows international finance? You can be had on a, on a uh, money laundering scheme easily and not even recognize that's what you're in. Uh, so any way that you do not have good knowledge or you do not have ability or you have a vulnerability, they call them vulnerabilities, then they arrange scenarios just like you would write a movie. Uh, in fact, they do it with computers, it's all computerized. And in this scenario, we, have, we write a play where this particular vulnerability is going to be exploited in the target. Now, they keep deep psychological profiles on lots of useful fellows. Uh, these are people who basically have knee-jerk reactions or something, or they're radical, or they have some kind of way they interact which, if could be connected with you, would be in the area we wish the interaction to occur, to get you off into something else totally different from what you're doing. So the next thing you know here, all it takes to set that up may be a phone call and stimulate the interaction to occur. And then the controllers sit back and watch the game go. It's gaming. But it's just like right, watching a movie scenario. Uh, one of these days, we'll probably write a book on gaming and how it's done and... and uh, 
what kind of the main games they can use. But I can tell you they're very effective. Um, you can get so many different games from so many different walks of life by so many charming folks who are really oily characters that you would not believe it. And those come at you in mass. And usually they bury you. They bury you off in the courts. They bury you off. They get you tricked into doing an illegal act. How would they do that if you, if you wouldn't violate the law? Real simple. How can you be made to violate the law when you're not a criminal? Simple. Let me give you a for instance. A fellow comes in and he says, you know, we really need to get some real major financing. Every inventor's poor. Everybody's struggling. Nobody's got the money to build all these buildups, which may cost ten, fifteen thousand dollars twenty thousand $20,000 apiece. So everybody's struggling for money. So he comes in and we're going to raise this. We're going to form a stock company. We're going to do all these good things. Unbeknownst to you, he goes off to the Securities Exchange Commission and several other people, Treasury Department, and he says, hey, I think I have fallen in with a den of thieves. Of course, he's the CEO now, understand? Of course, he's the guy who knows all this stuff. And I'll tell you what I'll do. If, uh, if you'll give me immunity to prosecution, I'll help you catch these crooks because they're going to do the greatest Monday laundering thing you ever heard of. It's going to come right out of one of these foreign countries. It's going to be scrubbed and come in here to fund this effort. It's going to be laundered dope money or something like that. You have no knowledge this is happening. And they give him. They jump at the chance. They'll give him the uh, immunity to prosecution. That's their normal modus operandi. They want to catch some crooks, and this guy's going to help them catch some crooks. So then he goes off and sets all this up and keeps you deluded about what's happening. Now you wind up in a, where the thing is going to be consummated somewhere, and if you consummate it, you wind up behind bars for about 20 years wondering how you got there when you never did anything to money launder anything. He's the fellow who did it and who set it up, and he testifies against you because he's immune to prosecution. This is one of the standard games. Machiavellia is not dead, he still lives. And these are the games that are played, and it's particularly played in the, the systems where people are trying to build over unity systems. It's been very effective in stopping some of them. Has, do you think lethal force has been used? Lethal force is used. I worked with an inventor, for example, the Sparky Suite is quite well known. And uh, he was shot at once with a silenced rifle from about, a sniper rifle from about 300 yards. The only thing that saved his life was uh, he was an old guy and very feeble there towards that part of his life. And he was stumbling as he coming up the steps and he fell down. He just flat fell down on the steps, caught his foot and fell right forward. And as his head went forward, the bullet went right by where his head was. And of course, the assassin was never found. So there are many cases like that. Some are killed. I believe uh, Marinoff, I believe, to be a kill. I don't believe Marinoff jumped off a building when he was excited on the way to, to uh, talk about his invention and so forth. Gave no indications of it. If I can believe the reports of the people who visited where his body lay, uh, where his body lay on the pavement glowed. And there's only one weapon in, on earth that will kill a human body and leave uh, where it lay, lies on the cement, let the cement glow under it. And that's a longitudinal wave shooter, what's called a shooter. So I believe, my personal belief, I can't prove this in a court of law, I don't intend to try, but my personal belief is that Marinoff was killed. He was probably killed by either the KGB or one of their agents from one of the other Iron Curtain, Curtain countries, killed with a shooter and thrown off the building to make it look like suicide. The police probably knew about it, that's why they let the body lay so long before they moved it. They didn't want to tangle with the longitudinal waves from it.